Solar Alberta's 2023 Solar Show. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's session, which is Solar 101 for home and business owners. Uh, please note that we have enabled closed captioning for this presentation. You can turn on the captioning at the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We are recording this session and it will be avail available on our website and YouTube channel following the show. So my name is Grace Brown and I sit on the board of directors at Solar Alberta. I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from the town of Cochrane, which is situated on Treaty 7 territory. Treaty 7 territory is the traditional gathering place and home of the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations, the Sutina First Nation, and the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pikani, and Kainai First Nations. It's also the homelands of the Métis Nation Region, region 3. So we were delighted to have so many people register for this week and for this event as well. Uh, we would like to take a moment to thank City of Edmonton Change for Climate for sponsoring the 2023 Solar Show and Spot Power for sponsoring this session. Today, we'll be hearing from two informative speakers and following their presentation, there will be a question and answer period and we'll wrap up this whole session in an hour. So some uh, housekeeping things, as this is an online conference and trade show, I would like to encourage you all uh, to check out our online trade show during this week. We have listed on this slide and in the chat all of the wonderful organizations who are participating in the trade show. You can view their exhibitor booths, which include a listing of key solar-related services, contact information, and video introductions, and you can do that by clicking the link, which is popping up in the chat now. Uh, as well, during our formal uh, Q&A period, we will be using Zoom Q&A for questions rather than the chat box. So if you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A section and also go ahead and click on the little thumbs up symbols to upvote questions that you like so that we can make sure that we get to those first. Uh, and before we move on, we are going to do a quick poll to get a sense of who we have joining us today. So please take a minute uh, to answer this question that just popped up on your screen now. And while some are still doing the poll, I would also encourage you to go ahead and pop your name, your land acknowledgement, and um, any contact information that you would like to share uh, in the chat now and throughout the event so that everyone can look you up on LinkedIn and uh, you all can stay connected. All right, so there is the results of the poll. So we have a lot of curious folks today, um, as well as some professionals and students, wonderful. <clears throat> so yeah, thank you all for participating. It is it's always helpful to know a little bit of our audience about a little bit about our audience before we dive in. <clears throat> so let's dive in. Uh, so it is my privilege uh, today to present some information about Solar Alberta. Solar Alberta is now in its 32nd year of operation. We are a not-for-profit society that is dedicated to accelerating Alberta's transition to a just and sustainable energy future. We do this by advocating, educating, <clears throat> excuse me, and serving as an industry and community hub for solar energy. Our membership is made up of over 360 individuals and businesses, and you can keep up to date on all of our activities by subscribing to our newsletter at solaralberta.ca. <clears throat> so we provide a number of services, including managing a solar directory through our website. Uh, this way we act as a bridge for installers, suppliers, and other solar related businesses to connect with their customers and clients. And you can see a screenshot of the directory here and we'll also drop a link to it in the chat. 
And in addition to our website services, we run educational programs such as this solar show, uh, our Thursday lunch hour seminar series, and we also host in-person and online networking events. If you're interested, you can also access recordings of 2021 and 2022 solar show sessions and seminars uh, on our Solar Alberta YouTube channel. And we have a lot going on this spring. <clears throat> In addition to industry-oriented solar show workshops, we are once again offering a number of online courses for solar industry professionals or those who are transitioning into this sector. Uh, we have seven courses that are held online on Tuesday and Thursday evenings, um, three to five nights over two to three weeks. So registration is currently open for all of our courses, and you can register at the link in the chat that will be showing up here in a bit. And recordings of these courses are also available alongside of our paid workshops uh, in the new solar training videos section of our website. And we would love to take this opportunity to encourage you to join Solar Alberta as a member. So this week from February 6th through 10th only, you can purchase an individual or student membership with a 20% discount. So we're sharing that link to become a Solar Alberta member uh, in the chat now. And I would also love to invite you to join us at our annual general meeting on April 5th. The AGM is open to all Solar Alberta members and we will elect the new board of directors at that time. There are currently four vacancies to fill on the board. So if you're interested in applying to serve, uh, please submit your application on our website. We're accepting applications until February 26th. We are also uh, happy to announce that we will be recognizing longtime dedicated contributors to solar in Alberta by gifting them a free lifetime Solar Alberta membership. So if you're currently a Sol Solar Alberta individual or business member and you know of someone who has contributed significantly to the organization or the solar sector in Alberta as a whole, please consider nominating them for this award. We are accepting nominations until March 22nd, and the award recipients will be announced at our AGM. And finally, uh, today, we ask that you please consider participating in our 50-50 raffle that supports Solar Alberta. Uh, sales for, the, uh, for these tickets are closing this Friday, uh, February 10th, and our executive director will be doing the draw live at 8 p.m. during the so Stories from Solar Sector Workers and Networking Night. Um, additionally, please consider donating through the crowdfunding link that's in the chat now. The Government of Alberta is matching all donations that are made through this link uh, until the end of this week. So now that you know more about Solar Alberta, I am delighted to get this session underway by welcoming our sponsor, Darren Chu from Spot Power. He will introduce Spot Power and then introduce our speakers for today. Welcome, Darren. Thanks for that introduction, Grace. Again, my name is Darren Chu and I'm here representing Spot Power and the Solar Club, one of the sponsors for this year's Solar Show. Uh, we are proud to sponsor the Solar Show because of our Solar Club, has become the premier solar benefit program for small microgenerators in Alberta. Originally called the Light Up Alberta program, our solar club gives members access to a slew of special benefits such as unique high and low export rates, annual cashback payments on all energy imported, free renewable energy certificates, or RECs for short, to offset 50% of your consumption, and more. Uh, our solar club is built upon four pillars. Uh, one, to help boost members' return on their investment in their solar PV systems through great rates, the cashback program, and the opportunity to profit from the sale of carbon credits. Number two, to help members achieve net zero or even net positive status by aggregating all members' exports. Number three, collectively make a positive environmental statement by exporting 100 million kilowatt hours onto the grid by 2030. And number four, to promote RECs as an environmental benefit in addition to solar energy exported into the grid. We recently issued this year's cashback payments. 
uh, in aggregate, the value of the benefits paid out to Solar Club members in 2022 total over $5 million. That includes export credits, the cashback refund, and free recs, and is a five-fold increase over what was paid out in 2020. This just goes to show how quickly solar adoption has grown, and as we can see from the uh, participants in today's session, um, there's obviously a lot of interest. The Solar Club also aims to export over 100 million kilowatt hours of green energy back into the grid by 2030. Since the program started in 2019, we've exported a total of 43.4 million kilowatt hours of solar energy back into Alberta's grid. At the current growth rate, we anticipate that we'll reach our goal ahead of schedule by 2026. We're so thrilled to see more members joining the Solar Club every year. Uh, with your help, the Solar Club can really make a genuine difference. We are so grateful for the support we've received that we're giving away $1,000 to a lucky Solar Club member this year. There's nothing to do except sit back and wait for us to draw a winner's name. If you know somebody on the fence about installing solar, or you're looking to do it yourself, let them know about the Solar Club and our upcoming contest draw. Uh, all the contest rules can be found on our website. I hope I've piqued your interest in our Solar Club and the benefits we offer. Uh, for more information, please visit spotpower.net, and I'll put our contact information in the uh, for our customer care team in the chat. I'd now like to introduce our speakers for today, Nick and Haley. Uh, Nick is the Solar Alberta Treasurer. He is also an electrical engineer who is currently working in the solar industry as a technical consultant. He has over four years of experience in the Alberta solar industry, ranging from 10 kilowatt residential projects for homeowners to 100 kilowatt commercial projects for municipalities to 100 megawatt plus hour, or sorry, 100 megawatt plus utility scale projects for Canada's largest developers. He has an interest in educating the general public about solar PV and is excited to be able to help contribute to shaping Alberta's current and future energy mix. Haley is Solar Alberta's course coordinator. She has a diploma and undergraduate degree in environmental science and an interest in supporting green infrastructure and decarbonization initiatives. Haley is also an energy advisor and has spent the last couple of years working in leading edge green building research. With these experiences, she aims to help advance Solar Alberta's mandates of training and advocacy to promote a just and sustainable transition within Alberta's energy sector. Haley is also excited to learn more about technical aspects of solar energy technologies and participate in creating a diverse and inclusive solar industry. I'll now pass the mic over to Haley and Nick to begin their presentation. Awesome, thank you so much, Darren. So, hi, um, my name is Haley Papato, and like Darren said, I'm the Solar Course Coordinator here at Solar Alberta. I'd like to take a minute to acknowledge that I am presenting to you today from the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Tanaha Nation and people, and the Kinbasket Shishwa people. Very grateful to live and play on these lands. Hey everyone, my name is Nick Wan Wong. Um, as Darren mentioned, I'm a board treasurer at Solar Alberta and also an engineering solar consultant. I'd also like to acknowledge I'm talking to you today from Edmonton, which is located on Treaty 6 territory and within the Métis homelands and Métis nations of Alberta Region 4. Awesome. So let's dive right into it. So we're going to talk today about how solar arrays in Alberta work in general, the different types of solar systems, and some of these solar trends that we are seeing. So solar used to be seen as a risky investment, but it's now viewed as a logical and necessary component of our energy sector that will continue to grow in usage and market share. This shift in perception is demonstrated by the impressive growth that the solar industry has experienced in Alberta. In particular, the growth of solar photovoltaics or solar PV. Solar PV harnesses the sun's light to produce electricity. While PV is what is taking off in Alberta, there's also solar thermal, which uses the sun's heat. So we're not gonna really talk about solar thermal, just solar PV. Alberta is home to a range of PV system sizes, anything under five megawatts. So that's like that big M and a big W is considered microgeneration in Alberta, which leaves a lot of room for variety. You've all likely spotted a solar array or two on a home in your neighborhood. These residential systems are very small and um, at, are at around five kilowatts, so a little K and a big W. Microgeneration arrays under 150 kilowatts are considered small, 
And larger microgeneration systems, often called commercial systems, can power businesses or non for profits. So, per the Government of Alberta's microgeneration regulation, all microgeneration in Alberta, whether residential or commercial, must be sized to produce equal to or less than the annual on site electricity consumption. So, microgenerators are not allowed to produce more. Um, and sell solar power for profit. So they can only produce what they're gonna be using. We're gonna talk more about this in the next slides. So this slide here shows some examples of large scale commercial microgeneration from around Alberta, including one of the largest rooftop arrays in the country at Freedom Cannabis. And something we get a lot of calls on um, about at Solar Alberta is solar for farms like this one in Linden. So now off to Nick for some more of a microgeneration. Thanks Haley. So let's take a look, look at the growth of microgeneration in Alberta over the past seven or eight years. So in 2015, on the left-hand side of the graph, we only had about five megawatts of solar on the grid. But now in 2023, we have over 156 megawatts of installed microgeneration solar projects across 10,800 systems. So you can see that there's been also a large jump in large-scale microgeneration installations particularly starting in 2019. And this is really due to the rise of the larger commercial scale projects, such as the ones that Haley mentioned on the previous slide. Solar projects between one and five megawatts were enabled under amendments to microgeneration regulation in Alberta in 2016. And that really opened up a lot of opportunities for the industry. So we are also seeing tremendous growth in Alberta utility scale systems. So systems that have the capacity to generate more than five megawatts of energy are classified as utility scale. All of the yellow dots on this map show planned utility scale solar farms in our area. In January, 2020, Alberta had 117 megawatts of utility scale solar generating capacity. By January of this year in 2023, that had increased to over 1100 megawatts. And solar farms are anticipated to add over 13,000 megawatts more generating capacity by 2025. Additional projects are being announced regularly because there's somewhat of a gold rush to capitalize on Alberta's good solar land right now. While microgeneration systems are not allowed to sell the power that they produce, utility scale solar producers can participate in Alberta's energy market and sell the clean power that they produce either directly to the grid or through a power purchase agreement to a large buyer such as RBC or Labatt. In our November 2022 seminar, panelists dove into PPAs, which are power purchase agreements, and utility scale systems in more detail. If this is something that interests you, you can watch the recording on our YouTube channel. The number of projects that have recently been announced is truly incredible, but solar still only makes up about 5% of Alberta's total energy generating capacity, and all renewables make up approximately 25% of our generating capacity. So we definitely have a long way to go to meet Canada's goal of net zero electricity by 2035. So in addition to the microgeneration and utility scale solar projects, the community solar space is also emerging quite a bit in Alberta. Community generation is where a group of people come together and invest in the solar development that is not on their own property. A number of cooperatives and indigenous nations are leading the charge with community generation in Alberta. So while community generation is still in its early stages here, it has the potential to allow apartment dwellers, renters, and others who don't have a solar appropriate roof and opportunity to use solar power. You can learn more about community generation solar at the How to Do Community Generation in Alberta session on Thursday at noon. So do register for that if you haven't already. Awesome. And so there's essentially two broad categories for solar on farms. So there's solar exclusive farms that are over five megawatts and are typically on brown fields or areas that do not have great land for farming. And then there are agrivoltaic systems, which is the practice of com combining solar PV with food production. So these are sometimes utility scale, but they're also sometimes commercial scale. There are also different ownership structures for solar on farms, including some on which the land and the solar array are both owned by the same organization, or those on which the land is leased from an owner that is different from the solar installation company. So we have a free webinar on our website about the Innisfail solar and sheep farm that has used this lease model to take root. 
Solar can be integrated on all sorts of farms, including those producing honey, wine, and herbs, um, as well as those with livestock. So in fact, some of, on some farms, solar PV is being used to protect sheep, cows, and other animals from hail and other increasingly hostile weather, pattern, weather patterns in Alberta. Agrivoltaic, this blending of solar with food production, is highly recommended by those worried about food security. And some municipalities are in fact requiring this integration of crop or livestock, livestock farming alongside solar and establishing solar siting guidelines before allowing solar developments to take place on good farmland. So we have developed some solar siting recommendations that are on our website for municipalities interested in being more intentional about solar project development. So off to Nick now for some info on Alberta's solar potential. So one question that we often get is what's really driving the growth of solar PV in Alberta? So there's definitely a lot of reasons, but as you can see here on this map, Alberta is next to Saskatchewan in terms of uh, solar PV generating potential, as you can see from all that lovely orange color that we've got in the south of our province. As well, we're the only province in Canada where a private solar um, developer can sell power directly to customers through a power purchase agreement, and that's also attracting a lot of investment to the province. And finally, as well, the cost of solar has come down quite a bit in the recent years, um, which is also another factor for driving a lot of investments in Alberta. Great. So let's talk more about how solar generation works in Alberta on a typical home. So I think a lot of you have probably seen this image or something quite similar, so I'll, I'll cover it quickly. But first, the sunlight hits the solar modules that are installed on your home. In the northern hemisphere, south-facing roofs get the best sun, but east and west-facing roofs also work. The PV modules convert sunlight into DC or direct current electricity. This electricity travels to the inverter, which converts the DC energy into AC alternating current electricity that the home uses. So this electricity is fed into the house's main electrical panel. From here, the electricity generated by the solar system can go in one of two directions. So if your house is not consuming a lot of energy at the moment, so for example, at 10 a.m. when no one's home, then the electricity can go back to the main power grid because it isn't being used by the house. So this will show up as a, uh, as a credit on your energy bill. If your house is using a lot of energy, so an example is at 4 p.m. when you get home and you turn on all the lights and you start making dinner, then the electricity from the solar system <clears throat> will be used to power everything that is using electricity in your home at that time. So since this energy is coming directly from your solar system rather than the, <clears throat> sorry, rather than the electricity grid, you aren't being charged for that electricity. So when you get solar, you get a bi-directional meter, which keeps track of both the energy taken from the grid as well as the energy put back onto the grid. So currently you cannot have a solar system installed on your house that produces more energy than you consume in a year. So for example, if your household currently consumes about 5,000 kilowatt hours a year, you cannot install a solar system that will produce more than the 5,000 kilowatt hours in a year. So a common question that people have is, will solar get me off the grid? In Alberta, your home will almost always be connected to the utility grid. This allows the grid to serve as a backup electricity source that will supply you with electricity when you need more power than your system produces. For instance, at night or when it's cloudy um, or even during the winter months. So these, this grid connection is really important to ensure a reliable energy supply. So I think it's time for us to transition into the fun part, the finances, and how some folks can save some money. Thanks, Ailey. So here in Alberta, we can choose our retail electric provider. So the cost of electricity that you pay, or rather the energy, will depend on the retailer. So here we can choose either the regulated rates option or seek a competitive price retailer, such as an, such as an energy cooperative. All retailers will offer different rates. So to help shop around for an affordable rate, Albertans can use the Utilities Consumer Advocates Cost Comparison Tool. Um, alternatively, if you just use uh, UCA in your search engine, uh, you'll probably find this tool quite easy. And what helps is that it lays out all the different retailers available in Alberta and their different rates. So it's a cool one-stop shop to shop around. Getting solar for your home will help reduce two utility bill components. So first off, it will reduce the amounts you pay for electricity energy used. 
And with the properly sized system over the course of the year, you can save close to 100% of this energy charge components. This is, amount of, um, this is amount that the power company will no longer get paid given that they are no longer making your electricity. The credits generated in the summer will offset your winter months when you're importing and buying electricity from your retailer. Secondly, solar will reduce the variable components of what you pay for what are called transmission and distribution, distribution costs. These costs cover the wire systems and electrical infrastructure, transmission lines, or underground cables. The transmission and distribution costs have a fixed component, and those won't change regardless of how much electricity you use in the month. However, solar can help with the variable components, and that changes based on the number of kilowatt hours of electricity you use. So while there are many financial benefits to solar PV, um, some things to note is that it won't fully reduce your transmission and distribution costs, because again, some of those are fixed. They also won't eliminate administrative or local access fees, as these are also fixed costs that come from simply being attached to the grid, as well as any administrative fees that cover issuing bills and providing credits. Finally, obviously solar PV won't impact your home or water heating charges, um, which for the most part in Alberta are powered by natural gas, and those can make up for around 40% of your monthly utility bills. To reduce these charges, you could consider to um, electrifying different, uh, different loads in your house. So for instance, you might install an air or ground source heat pump for home heating and cooling, or an electric water heat pump that your solar system can power. You can also look into installing a solar thermal water heating system, although these can be a little more cost prohibitive um, as opposed to solar photovoltaic or PV. Finally, your electricity retailer may off also offer a solar club, um, such as our wonderful sponsor today, through which you can opt into different electricity rates, which are higher during the summer and lower during the winter. And this can be beneficial because it allows you to export electricity from your home to the grid at the higher rates when your system generates more electricity in the summer. And conversely, um, you pay less in the winter when you aren't generating as much solar production anyway. So let's take a look at three bills from the same household to kind of give a bit of an example. So these are from a real home in Edmonton in 2021 to show the before and after impact of solar. So before solar, the house's total electricity charge was $173 for about uh, um, 1,100 kilowatt hours used from the grid. This bill also shows the distribution, transmission, admin, and tax charges comprised of $93 for that bill, meaning that the $79 of the total bill was used for actual electricity used from the grid. After solar, the household is still a net consumer of power from the grid in the winter. So just a reminder that this bill does not show the electricity the household consumed at the time of production. It only shows the extra energy that was not needed at the time of production and went into the grid. So they received a $29 credit for the 350 kilowatt hours generated, and they were charged $58 for the 699 kilowatt hours that they drew from the grid. So there is still a distribution, transmission, admin tax, and tax fee of $64. You can see this is a reduction from the pre-solar bill because of the variable components. So the after-solar bill equals the amount of electricity drawn from the grid plus the admin transmission and distribution fees minus the kilowatt hours of electricity sent to the grid for a total of $93. So even in the winter when solar production is lower, this household is saving $80 on their winter bill compared to their pre-solar winter bill of 173. Now let's review the bill after solar in the spring. So this month they are now a net generator and are exporting more energy into the grid than they are using from it. Again, this bill does not show the electricity that the household consumed at the time of production. So this household is participating in the retailer solar club. So the energy cost is much higher per kilowatt hour than it was in the winter. But since the electricity cost is higher in the spring, the credits are also higher. There is still a distribution and transmission tax and admin fee of $62, but check out the credit that they received because they received $290 in bill credits for their solar systems generation. Their total electricity charge was actually a net credit of $23. So that will be applied towards their future bills. This represents $197 of savings compared to their pre-solar bill. 
So if we average these winter and spring savings out at about $130 per month, and assume that their installation costs $15,000 after rebates in Edmonton, this family will have saved the cost of their system in about 10 years. So we get a lot of questions on how snow impacts solar generation and what can be done about it. The short answer is that there's no way that you should worry about that. Snow will only reduce your annual energy production by about three to 5%. And this is really because since snow comes right around the same time of the year where there's the least sunlight and the shortest days, and that's the least potential production. Your installer will typically size your rate to ensure that your generating potential in the summer months will balance out what you have to draw from the grid in the winter months. And they'll also factor in snow and shorter days in their analysis so that over the course of the year, your electricity use will be net zero. So here, you can kind of see there's a typical bell curve demonstrating what energy production will look like in Alberta with a typical solar array over the course of the year. So while it is true that you will be producing less energy at home during the winter months, our solar potential during the summer is so high that you can relax and not worry about the snow. It's generally not recommended that you try to clean off the modules yourself, um, because not only is getting on the roof risky during the winter, but you may also damage the module coatings or cells if you brush them off without the proper equipment or techniques. The reason for that is that solar modules have an anti-reflective coating that when scratched or scraped will lessen the effectiveness of your panel. One benefit of solar modules is that they do tend to heat up a bit faster than your roof usually would, and as such, the snow will tend to melt off of them faster than it would melt off of your roof without them. So now that we've got snow out of the way, on to Haley to talk about costs and payback of the solar PV system. Thanks, Nick. Snow is very important. <laughs> so uh, if you're interested in solar panels for your own home, you can rest assured knowing that renewable energy and energy efficiency upgrades are home improvements that will pay for themselves. So given that solar panels are warranted for 25 years and can last up to 40 years, they will be adding value to your home for quite some time and paying for themselves by reducing your monthly electricity bills. It is important to keep uh, all of these benefits in mind when thinking about the return on investment. So nowadays, a typical home can install, uh, a typical home install can cost between 10 to $30,000 and can take anywhere from seven to 15 years to pay back. That's really depending on the size and the cost of the array, the amount of energy you consume, and what other financing mechanisms you have in place for some payment. So installers should calculate the estimated payback time as part of the initial quote process. It's hard to estimate without looking at the particular circumstances because it can differ significantly from region to region around the province and again based on the mechanism that you are using to finance the installation. Since the system will be sized to the current site electrical usage, homeowners can improve upon the estimated payback time by further reducing their energy consumption or performing other energy efficiency upgrades after their solar installation has been completed. So one additional important consideration when thinking about the overall cost and the payback time with solar is that the property value increases. So there isn't much data available in Canada yet about this um, regarding home resale value with solar, but research in the States indicate that houses with solar panels um, and solar power typically sell for 4.1% more than those without. So this is likely because the house with solar panels already installed will have significantly reduced future electricity bills, which might um, which future like home buyers might appreciate. And also because the solar panels are typically warranted for 25 years and actually last much longer than that, they are a long-term improvement to a house. So now over to Nick for some more info on solar incentives. Thanks, Ailey. So an installation of 10 to $30,000 is quite a lot for a lot of Albertans to afford. Um, so as such, there are new low and no interest solar financing programs that are available to help. So in many municipal municipalities around Alberta, CEIP or SEEP is being implemented. SEEP stands for Clean Energy Improvement Program, and it is Alberta's version of a program that is sometimes called PACE in other jurisdictions. What it is, is it's a financing approach that allows for solar or energy efficiency upgrades to be financed through property taxes. 
And you can have the costs of the upgrade tied to the property rather than to the property owner. SEEP was made possible through recent changes to the Municipal Governance Act. If a municipality has SEEP financing in place, then potential solar owners typically do not need to put any money down, and they can begin to pay back the cost of the solar installation on a monthly basis, often over 20 years with low interest rates, while at the same time recognizing the monthly financial benefits on their electricity bill. Additionally, with SEEP, that monthly payment will be passed on to the next homeowner if people move before they complete the payments. Many SEEP programs will pay out 50% for upfront costs and then will pay the contractor directly for the remaining cost when the project is complete. Sometimes there might be some additional costs associated with the solar array if your roof or your electrical wiring needs to be upgraded or replaced. In the case of SEEP, these can often be partially included in the financing. If you're looking for more info, check out myceip.ca for more info about this new program. Additionally, there's also the federal Canada Greener Homes Loan and Canada Greener Homes Grants for $5,000 towards solar. The Greener Homes Loan is a zero interest option, which is rolling out alongside the Greener Homes Grants that you can pay back over a 10 year period. This option will only cover 15% upfront and the rest will be reimbursed to the homeowner about three months after completion. More information can be found by searching for Canada Greener Homes. If you are doing a deep energy retrofit and need more than either of these programs provide, they can be combined for a total of $90,000 if desired. And finally, other than seed financing and the new Canada Greener Homes loan and grants, you can also talk to your bank, credit union, um, or credit union about low interest bank loans, line of credit, mortgage add-ons, or you can also chat with some of the solar installation companies that offer a lease to own option. So speaking of solar installation companies, turn it over to Haley now to close us off with how we can find a solar installer. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. So last slide before we take some questions. But now that you all know the things that you need to know about installing solar, let's talk about how to find someone to do it. So the one-stop shop for finding a solar in installer in Alberta is our Solar Alberta website at solaralberta.ca. So on the website, you can find the Alberta solar map as well as the directory that lists over 130 Solar Alberta business members. There you can read about how many um, other systems various companies have installed and how long they've been in business. So it's good to get um, some sort of sense on whether they'll be around to follow through on any repairs that are needed during the workman warranty period. On the website, you can also submit a request for proposals or quotes. We recommend you secure at least three. So you will want to have a look through the, through the quotes to determine how long the warranties are for their products and their work and what their practice is for maintenance and disposal at the end of life. Inverter warranty is usually from the manufacturer for about 10 years. The modules themselves are typically also manufacturer warrantied for 25 to 30 years. And workman warranties are often for anywhere between two to five years. So we also recommend you request references and proof of insurance. We also recommend you let the installers who you connect with through Solar Alberta help you find some financing. So the financing question can be addressed in a wide variety of ways that many installers are very well versed on. And also please watch out for a few potential red flags, such as if the installer tells you you will be completely net zero or you will never pay utility bills again. Remember that while solar can make you net zero from an electricity perspective, uh, consider your home's heating and hot water sources as these are still likely natural gas. If an installer is making false claims about you or being com uh, about you being completely net zero, then this could be an indication that they are willing to mislead customers or that they're not very knowledgeable on their home energy use. Also, as you know from our bill review, it's not true that you will never pay util utility bills again. So you, will, you can receive the credits in the summer months that will offset many of the costs in the winter. But as we have discussed, there are some fixed costs that you cannot get around. And there's also significant variability between winter and summer months. So use caution if engaging with an installer who suggests that you will Never pay utility bills again because uh, that's way too good to be true. So I'm going to pass the mic back to Grace and we can start the Q&A. 
Awesome. Thanks, Haley and Nick, for that informative presentation. We have uh, quite a few questions in the Q&A uh, section, and uh, I will, yeah, I'll just go ahead and dive right in so that we can try and get all of them answered. Uh, so to start, a couple of people have asked, why do, uh, why can't you install more solar than your home will use? And uh, I'll turn that to to Nick or Haley, whoever wants to answer that one. Sure, I can take that one. Um, so take this with a grain of salt, given that I'm an engineer and less so a policy person. So I guess there's two levels to that question. Um, kind of on the more surface level of things, um, the reason why through the micro generation regulation that um, typically for home solar you would apply through, uh, the reason why you can't sell more than you produce is because of how it's written um, in the generation in the micro generation regulation. So um, in that case, it's basically just because of the law. Um, now going into kind of a more philosophical uh, depth of response there. Um, I'm not sure if Heather can touch more upon this, but uh, essentially, yeah, there's there's other reasons someone's going to have to pay for that electricity at the end of the day, but um, Heather, maybe I'll turn it over to you to talk a bit more about, uh, about, about that. About that, yeah. So I think Gordon Howell answered, touched on this a bit. I mean, if someone really wants to size larger than their usage, I mean, they could theoretically take the approach of a power plant and apply <laughs> through the, um, the other acts that are out there. So the Electric Utility Act is what uh, the um, large uh, power producers would use, or we also have the small scale uh, generation regulation that is available to some. Uh, there are many who find those regulations difficult to work through. So the benefit of the micro generation regulation is that it, it really simplifies things for home and business owners. So, so that you don't have to go through such a long process. So in an effort, to simplify the process and enable homes and businesses to have solar, essentially the government uh, reduced a number of sort of the hoops that you have to jump through if you're typically a power producer in the province. And so this is actually customary across the country and in many jurisdictions, um, they basically don't make you jump through as many hoops as a typical power plant would have to uh, in terms of getting your, uh, your uh, system up on the grid. Um, but the compromise that was found is that they're going to limit the size of the array to your uh, previous year's usage. So I think that was the original uh, intent was essentially uh, to allow home and business owners to have a solar array for their own electrical use, but um, not to make them jump through all the hoops that a normal uh, power producer would jump through. Um, so I think that was the original intent. Um, there were also some questions and fears that if everybody adopted solar tomorrow, <laughs> it might overwhelm the system uh, in the summer. If we're all pushing a whole bunch of energy onto the grid in the summer, um, we haven't seen the, the level of, of rooftop solar array uptake that I think they were envisioning when the microgeneration regulation was first adopted. So I think those fears are, are largely unwarranted at this point. Um, and now that we have battery storage and other techniques coming online, I think we can start to um, adjust for the variability. But folks might want to tune in. We are we had a recording of our keynote speaker last night. It'll be up on our YouTube channel in a few weeks. Uh, the ISO speaker talks a lot about the variability of solar. Um, we, as microgenerators, produce tons in the summer, and we produce very little in the winter because, of course, we don't have as much light. Um, and that variability makes the, the grid folks a little nervous because uh, they're not sure what to do with all of our all of our demand in the winter, but then all of our supply in the summer. So it's very uh, irregular. And um, because of that, a few protections were put in place to make sure that we're not oversupplying the grid. That said, uh, Solar Alberta is currently advocating for changes to the microgeneration regulation. We do believe that the system can withstand more power from microgenerators. So we would like to see that cap removed on microgenerators. And we have an advocate with us section on our website. You're welcome to go there. Help us send some letters to the government asking to allow micro generators to do unlimited export, which is what that's called when you produce as much as you uh, can with your with your solar resource on your roof. So, um, yeah, lots of 
Great discussion. I don't want to take this totally offline, but I'm here for any of those policy questions. I thought I'll, I'll throw my suit jacket on and we can talk policy with me and talk technical with Haley and Nick. Thanks, Heather. And thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, so another question is Diane wants to know if you install battery storage along with solar in your home and the grid goes down, do you have the ability to switch over to your own battery backup, uh, in, uh, particularly since you have a bi-directional meter? I feel like Nick, since you're in, you're the engineer, do you want to take a first stab at that? <laughs> sure, sure. Yes, I can. Um, also with the caveat that I'm more on the commercial and uh, utility scale space now, so less so on residential, but there are technologies nowadays, they're called hybrid inverters that you can install. Um, so it's, again, the inverter is the unit that will convert DC electricity from your modules to AC electricity that your home uses. Um, so these hybrid inverters, um, you can install them without batteries most of the time, but essentially if you do install them with batteries, what they'll do is they'll come off the grid when they sense the grid is down and they'll provide power to a critical loads panel. So say for like your refrigerator or any like significant loads that you wanna keep um, running in terms of the power outage. So it does exist. Um, I hope I'm not speaking out loud because it's been, been a few years since I've done Resi backup, but uh, yeah, short answer, it is possible. Yeah, we've had a few questions about that lately, actually. I think it's called islanding or the ability to island. Um, and so I think people should talk to their residential installers about those those meters you were talking about, Nick, because they are possible. I have a friend who has one. Uh, so theoretically, uh, if he had the, the on-site battery storage, um, if, you, if you were becoming a little island in the middle of the winter, um, in Alberta with solar and no battery or electric vehicle to back you up, that would be kind of pointless, right? Because you're not really generating much. Um, but if it was the middle of the summer and you, you know, we had a big, I don't know, power outage for some reason, then theoretically uh, you could produce a fair bit for yourself. But the meter that you're talking about, Nick, that's the one that protects the electricians, right? So that if there's anyone working to restore power in the community, they're not going to be injured by the power you generate. I think it's a, a safety consideration, right? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. And I see in the chat there, Christopher, you mentioned that there's a potential safety risk backfeeding onto the grid, which is absolutely true. Um, with these hybrid inverters, they are certified and manufactured to certain standards so that that doesn't happen. Um, so I, I guess kind of take home message there is make sure that you use a a certified solar installer or a reputable one and that they're using um, equipment certified for use in Canada. So um, again, kind of the key word that you'll want to talk to installer about if you're interested in batteries are hybrid inverters, like hybrid electric vehicles. Perfect. I don't really have anything else to add to that. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, moving on to a question about uh, your bill with solar. So Les wants to know, how can you tell which part of the transmission and distribution charges on my NMAX bill are variable and which part are fixed? They, right now it just has one single dollar value for transmission and one for distribution. So is there any way to tell uh, if part which part of that will go down? Well, the one, I mean, one thing I can tell you is, is different retailers do show you that. So you may want to ask them to show you, <laughs> uh, you know, you might want to push your retailers to show you the numbers. Cause I know there are some who do, do get it broken down. Um, and it's a shame that you're not, uh, Haley, Nick, anything to add? Yeah. I was just going to say to ask for a breakdown. I'm not familiar with NMAX's utility bills, but um, or they should have some standard rate on their website for that as well, because your transmission and distribution charges will also be a bit dependent on your electricity usage. So there's that too. Yeah, uh, this is one of my personal quips about how somewhat confusing it is to read your electricity bill in Alberta. Um, it is, it is public, it is on the different um, wire service providers websites. So for instance, NMAX, Fortis, Epcor, ACO. Um, if you search up distribution and transmission tariffs, they basically like have this PDF schedule um, of what you pay for like a per day fixed cost of your transmission and distribution costs. 
and also a per kilowatt hour cost, um, uh, which is a variable component there. So if you do search up your wire service provider, so NMAX distribution and transmission tariff, um, you will be able to find that information. Um, I do agree though, it's it's not simple. I wish that they would just kind of separate out on the bill easier, like and just standardize it between all the different retailers. If you really want to dive deep into it, I would suggest our course on the economics of grid tied solar PV, um, because our instructor Rob will like goes into depth about that and, and takes you through those PDFs to um, help break down the electrical charges. So Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I feel like that should be a simple question, but it's so complicated and there are so many different facets to it. So you kind of have to take a whole course on how to understand your electric bill. <laughs> but uh, speaking of courses, uh, Mike wants to know if there is any difference between Nate's solar design course and um, the solar design course provided by Solar Alberta. It's a great question. Um, I'm not familiar with Nate's solar design course, but our solar design course runs five nights for two hours per night. So that's a total of 10 hours of instructional time. Um, and I assume that that would be the big difference between ours and Nate's because I assume Nate's would be a whole semester. And um, yeah, it goes over system design and modeling and really goes like goes through different types of systems and code requirements and um, goes over a few of the design and modeling tools as well. So feel free to send me an email if you're looking for anything specific or you want to know the modeling tools that we use. It's just my first name at solaralberta.ca. I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, I cheated a bit and looked it up while you guys were presenting and I did see that Nate's is 33 hours. So I guess um, their course costs about three times as much and it's about three times as long. Those are the main differences. So I assume that means they can cover maybe more programs and more things, <laughs> but it did look very similar, Haley. So that was interesting to see. Um, definitely going to be some duplication of efforts, but we do work pretty well together with Nate as well. Uh, sometimes we coordinate our efforts better than other times. <laughs> a little competition in the space is not a bad thing for people coming in, wanting to co compare costs as well, though, hey? Oh, I see Rob is also online right now, our solar economic oh, um, perfect. course instructor. So <laughs> good to see you, Rob. <laughs> Hi, Rob. Welcome. <laughs> you know, that's actually a good segue because Rob has put a very specific question into the Q&A that I'm just going to read verbatim to make sure that I get it. Uh, and I'm going to open that question to whoever wants to answer it. Rob wants to know, how is solar export credit affected by the government's current cap and deferral program at 13.5 cents per kilowatt hour? What value is given for solar export credit, uh, the cap or the actual kilowatt hour price? And what happens when we are paying back the deferral? Hmm. Good question, Rob. I would probably have asked you that question is the problem here. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. We might have to take that one away and do some digging. Nick, you have any thoughts to add on that one? Or should we take that away and get back to Rob later? All right, we're going to take that with us, Rob. Thanks for the question. All right, got some homework for us. Exactly. Good. Uh, well, here's one that I think we should be able to answer. Um, Mark wants to know if you can increase your solar uh, system in the future if your electricity usage goes up. For example, if you add heat pumps for water and space heating, um, add some EVs, can you, uh, can you size your system in the future to cover that? I'm in the process of doing that. So we, we actually moved into a home, we got our seven kilowatt array, and then we bought an EV after, and now we're increasing our array. Um, the downside is we can't get the city of Edmonton rebate a second time, but since we got our first one, the Canada Greener Homes grant and loan have come out, so we're going to be able to use those for our upgrades. So, um, yeah, you absolutely can increase it. All depends on your roof space at that point, I think. <laughs> we're, getting, yeah, we're, getting, <laughs> we're getting low on roof space, actually, because we live in a row house, so we're running out of roof space, so we're actually looking into how we can upgrade our garage uh, to uh, install enough to offset our electric vehicle. Or ground mounts in your backyard. 
a ground mount. I have, I don't know if anyone <laughs> wants to price that out for me. Yeah. <laughs> you could ground mount apparently costs a fair bit more than popping it on a roof, but I suppose if you're doing a massive roof repair, you might as well find out, find out what the ground mount would cost too. And maybe I'll have a really luscious garden of grapes underneath it. <laughs> I think that's a good solution. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll do my own little agrivoltaics here. We had a former board member who was working on that actually. He was setting up a, a essentially a, a beautiful garden in his backyard with a ground mount. Pricey, pricey stuff though, these ground mounts I hear. <laughs> yeah, you've got to like trench your your line out to your ground mount. That might be that might be kind of a, a serious undertaking for a row home. But uh or, or awnings, we also were considering because you can get solar awnings these days and our home came with no awnings and we've been really hot. So we were thinking, well, maybe we'll, we'll do awnings for the EV, but again, more expensive because it's a, a different kind of specialized product. So I might have to save up a while before I do that. <laughs> Good timing though, with the loan and the grant. Yeah, and, and Edmonton's Clean Energy Improvement Program is supposed to hopefully roll out by the end of this year. So we might be able to couple that too, if we decide to go the awnings route. So I don't know if we can dream, right? I guess I was leading into Emery's question here, if you want to go there next, because I just jumped to rebates naturally. <laughs> yeah, no, perfect. So there were a few questions about rebates. So yeah, we can start with Emery's about um, if the city of Edmonton or government of Alberta will be uh, renewing or um, having a new solar rebate program for 2023 in addition to the Greener Homes Initiative. No, yeah, well, that was our big win before Christmas. I think Nick and Haley got a, instead of a, <laughs> instead of a Happy New Year message, they got a, yay, the Edmonton Rebate Program is coming back message. Um, yeah, we pushed hard this fall to get the City of Edmonton to bring back their rebate program. We were successful in convincing council to actually amend their budget to include funds, not only for the rebate program to be extended, but actually also for the Clean Energy Improvement Program uh, to be rolled out in a fulsome way, hopefully by the end of the year. Uh, so our pitch was for them to at least maintain the rebates until the Clean Energy Improvement Program rolls. Um, so we don't know how long that rebate will be around, but uh, when it's retired, uh, at least we'll hopefully have a, a fulsome Clean Energy Improvement Program to help us along. Uh, so yes, yeah, so last night, I think Gordon mentioned uh, our keynote speaker, we had there our um, our sponsor for the week, City of Edmonton Change for Climate came and YC did announce that they are in fact going ahead with council's directive to relaunch the rebate program. I don't think she gave a specific date or anything, but uh, just make sure you're following our newsletter um, and we'll let you know. And also follow the Edmonton uh, Change for Climate newsletter because they will be the first to announce when that is relaunched. It may look a little different. We were pushing them hard. We said, if you don't have enough money for everyone because they keep running out of money, and we said, if you don't have enough money for everyone, then make sure you have enough money for low and fixed income folks, because, uh, you know, it's a real shame. Sometimes the city has a finite amount of funds. And if everybody snags up those funds with the double income household, uh, you know, six figures, then it's pretty frustrating for uh, people who don't uh, get the funds who are lower income. So uh, we did definitely push them to consider um, some kind of equity component when they relaunch it. So We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what it looks like when they launch. Oh man, I just checked the time and we have so many great questions. Uh, but I'm going to take one more question real quick and hopefully we can do a speed round to answer it uh, because a couple of people wanna know about either disconnecting from the electric grid or um, getting like a small, off-grid system that you could just power, use to power one thing. So that's kind of two questions in one. Um, if you get solar, can you disconnect from the grid? And would there be, what would the payback look like on that? And um, otherwise, are there small off-grid systems that you can use locally to power like specific things? Well, I'll give a very brief and then I'll turn it over. But I think it's actually really beneficial to be grid connected. If you want a quick payback, that's your best bang for your buck. So if you have any payback concerns at all, you want the grid. Um, and I think 99% of microgen in Alberta is grid connected because people are looking to pay it back. Um, so that's my initial thought. Anything though to add, Nick Haley? Yeah, yeah. Like 
if you're in the city, like Heather mentioned, um, it, you almost would never want to disconnect from the grid just because in their cities, it, the grid tends to be quite reliable. Um, once you're looking at going off grid, that means batteries. And batteries usually mean um, another several tens of thousands of dollars um, worth of investments, which I mean, you can pay the money, but in terms of payback, um, there won't really be a payback right now. Uh, what you're looking at is essentially paying for the reliability of the grid when the grid is out. And again, in the case of most places out in Alberta, that's pretty low. So I would say generally we wouldn't recommend uh, putting in battery systems. The only case where you might want to consider it is if you're, um, you've got some rural land that's really far away from an existing distribution line. And the distribution company is asking for like tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to run that line to your property, then maybe batteries will make sense. But otherwise, generally speaking, um, you can look at the costs, but it generally doesn't pay back. Yeah, I mean, using an EV as a battery, if you're going to have it anyways, you know, that's that's one nice option. But getting a battery as a standalone is still pretty expensive these days. Hey, um, so, yeah, your payback would be much slower, though, like the grid being connected to the grid, that is essentially allowing you to make a lot of money in the summer to cover your winter use, right? So, um, and then it also, if you're not grid connected, you'd probably have to overproduce significantly in the winter, hey Nick, to cover your small your usage in the winter months, I imagine. So you'd probably have to build a significantly larger system to have any reliability in the winter if you exactly. weren't connected. Exactly. And you're often also looking at a some sort of generator, um, gas power, diesel generator, regardless. Um, so yeah, it's yeah, I know yeah. it's temp it's tempting. I've talked to a lot of folks from rural Alberta who would love nothing more than to get rid of their distribution and transmission charges, but most of them when they crunch the numbers against battery storage and having to um, oversize their system and have all the backups, it's just it generally is still worth it to put up with your distribution and transmission providers, <laughs> no matter how irritated you are with them. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, it's it's never ideal, but I have noticed the cost of batteries is I've heard it's starting to come down. So maybe that equation will change in the coming years. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, OK, so we are at the top of the hour, so. Um... So it's time to say goodbye. Yeah, I was thinking we should all put uh, put our contact info in the chat because there's so many more questions here. If people want to fire their questions at me, I'll pick Nick and Haley's brains over the coming yeah. week. Yeah, thank you everybody for your really great questions and for the amount of questions that you had. That was a good discussion and I wish that we had time to answer all of them. But like Heather said, you can uh, email any of the panelists and uh, and Heather as well, and we'll get back to you with with that. So yeah, thanks Heather and uh, Nick and Haley for presenting in this session, and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you Spot Power for sponsoring, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thank you, Grace. Thank you so much. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, everyone. Well.